Hello and welcome to Just Films and That with me, Josh Hallam. And me, Alice Oliver. This is the podcast where we talk about films that we think are underrated, underappreciated, or we just wanted to talk about them. We're also going to get stuck into some classic films that one of us maybe hasn't seen and maybe throw in some great guests along the way. So we start uh, every week, as we always do, with a random question. Uh, Alice, what was your favourite subject at school? I would, I mean, I would probably say drama. Uh, That's probably the one that I was best at. Um, I enjoyed it. I guess as a kid, as a kid, I didn't really have any issues with confidence. I was super confident. Like, I'd go on stage, I'd do anything. And, I mean, that's gone as I've got older, obviously. (laughs) You know, as you get more things to be insecure about. but oh yeah, always like drama, and I think when you're good at something as well, and the and the teachers tell you you're good at something, that you know that's quite nice, and then it, it just kind of makes you like it a bit better. But in general, I did actually quite enjoy school. Um, like I suppose I saw the value in learning quite young. Um, and I was very good at maths, but I remember for my GCSE math, like I studied so damn hard. Like I would go into the school over weekends and stuff, like when the school was closed. Nerd alert. Oh, mate, now tell me about it, honestly. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, but no, drama, I guess, probably probably my, my fave. I was going to pick one. What about you? Um, I see. So, so I, despite the fact that I have a drama degree and I didn't do drama at school because um, I, <laughs> I did it extracurricular. So, like, I, I started drama at, um, on, like, a Saturday morning club and, and um, then uh-huh. I did my GCSE through that club through our teacher who so that was like on a that was a separate thing to school there wasn't really much extra but, school so you're a nerd too i did <laughs> yeah i did i actually did like i did a couple of extra gcse's but i failed <laughs> graphics because i didn't really want to do it so uh, you know when you have like that placeholder gcse that no one that you didn't want to do so i had a choice between graphics and food tech and i didn't want to buy the ingredients all the time so <laughs> i did graphics and just kind of went to the class and sat there and didn't really do anything because i knew i was doing these extra gcse's but anyway so my favorites because i can't have drama um i so actually really liked history hmm. like like i did a history gcse and i just found it really really interesting so i suppose i'd have to say history yeah yeah. And English I, as well. I liked English, um, like creative writing and stuff like that. I really didn't like history then, but now I look back and I'm like, oh man, free history lessons. Because yeah. I'm too older that you see the value in these things and you start enjoying them. It's really it's, backwards, really. They should, it's like, the same with science. Longer. It's the same with yeah, science. I find like, different. like as you get older... If they they make you do like I went to like a specialist science school, so we had to do science every single day, one type or another, and um, it was just such a drag. Like I didn't enjoy it. I was I never I was never really great at maths and science. I was more like English and you know, history and stuff like that. So, but now I look back on it and I do I like I find that sort of thing really interesting. But I, like you say, it's a bit like confidence as you get older. You just change as a person, don't you? Become more uh, interested in stuff, I guess. So, uh, this week's film is The Losers. It was chosen by myself. So, spoiler warning for The Losers, if you've not seen it. It came out in 2010, I think. Um, Give you a little bit of a synopsis on the film. Um, It's based on a comic book. Um, Basically, Jeffrey Dean Morgan plays the head of a team of elite soldiers who are on a mission. They go against the handler's instruction um, to save uh, a group of children. So, they are betrayed and left for dead and then a mysterious woman played by zoe saldana shows up and offers them a way to get their revenge on their handler who's the villain called max and so it's just about how they kind of get their revenge on on him really so alice um had you seen this one before 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 this week i hadn't seen it no and i hadn't heard of it so i was going in with completely fresh with this one with no preconceived ideas of what it was about or anything so that was quite nice so did you have any idea going into it any idea of what it was about or is it just did you did you even know it was a comic book i no no not at all this is one of them that was just completely not on my radar i have got some serious blind spots when it comes yeah. to film. I was like, 
messed. So that's, I suppose, that's kind of why I picked it. Not specifically because you hadn't seen them, but because I, I, so I remember when this came out, re, I was, so it's 10 years old. So I was kind of 19, 20 when it came out. And I just remember really enjoying it and thinking it was, and thinking it was kind of, I'd, I'd never heard other people talk about it. I remember thinking, so it, it must be quite underseen because not a lot of people seem to have seen it. It's not kind of mentioned um, in the veins of other comic book films. Um, and I think at the time I remember thinking it was underrated, but I was also interested to revisit the film because I'd only seen it probably that one time uh, just after it had come out. So I wanted to revisit it and kind of see how it had aged and if my uh, tastes had changed and stuff like that over the, the last 10 years. So I'm intrigued. Um, what did you think? I thought that it wasn't doing anything remarkable. It wasn't necessarily doing anything that I hadn't seen before. But there was certainly a lot to enjoy about it. And there were some, some choices in there, some style choices, um, some visual choices that I really, really appreciated. And we'll get into that a bit later, I'm sure. So overall, I certainly enjoyed it. Um, and I mean, I love Chris Evans. I love seeing him on screen. I think he's a fantastic character. I feel like he's one of these that you can just tell like you can just tell he's working hard. I feel like you can just always tell he's working hard. Um, but the rest of them as well, a really great ensemble, really, that all gel together quite nicely. I really loved Idris Elba. I thought his character was great. He had some of them, probably some of the more uh, stronger script parts as well. Because the script wasn't really necessarily that long. I did notice there were a lot of scenes that were just people walking away from a car. <laughs> or like walking yeah. away. Explosion. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of slow motion, slow motion walking to music. So this being the first time that you'd sort of re-watched it, what did you think? Did you sort of see in it the same things that you saw when you saw it originally? Yeah, so I was interested to see how my taste has changed. And I think they have changed a little bit. Obviously, I'm 10 years older for a start. I could see all the stuff in it that I enjoyed the first time round, but I could also spot some big flaws in there. So I came away, certainly came away with a different experience of the film. Um, did, overall, probably didn't enjoy it as much, but I am probably now past the target age. Uh, maybe not that much, but you don't get the impression this is kind of made for people coming into their thirties. Um, mm. So yeah, overall, I. I I did enjoy it. I like like you said, it's got a really really good cast. So you've got like Jeffrey Dean Morgan, Idris Elba, Chris Evans, Zoe Saldana, Jason Patrick, uh, a couple of other people in there. Um, the cast is great, and there's a really good chemistry between the, the, the cast. It's like really good banter between them. Like the script doesn't work if that cast doesn't bounce off each other really well. Um, I've not seen Jeffrey Dean Morgan in that much. Um, I know he's in Watchmen. I know he's in Batman versus Superman, and I think he's in. Is he in? I don't. I don't watch it. Was he in The Walking Dead? Oh, I don't watch that either. I think he's in The Walking Dead, but no, I enjoyed it. I thought um, it's interesting to see a pre Captain America Chris Evans because I obviously I have seen him in stuff like Not Another Team Movie and and Sunshine and and stuff like that, but I've not. He very much was then Captain America for quite a long time and didn't do much else. He did other stuff, but before he was Captain America, he quite often played like these dick douchey type characters. Didn't he like, like kind of quick witted, slightly kind of arrogant, obnoxious characters, like not another scene movie. And he plays the human torch in two of the, in, in the first two fantastic uh, four films. And it was, it was kind of nice to see him not, playing Captain America as that Boy Scout. He was certainly, the, it was two standout performances for me. Chris Evans was one. And the other was a, a scenery chewingly brilliant performance by Jason Patrick, who's the bad guy, Max. And I thought he was really good because again, I've not seen him in that much. I know he's in Speed 2. He's in Speed 2. That's all I know about him though. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, what else has he done? I have no idea. No, not a face that I'm familiar with, really, at all. So one of the things I like about the film is, is it, it takes what you perceive as comic book tropes, as in things you would see in a comic book, and adapts them almost directly to the way the action and the camera work looks. 
So if you didn't know this was based on like a DC comic book, I'm not sure you would know apart from the way it looks, because it's not a comic book film in the traditional sense of having superheroes and superpowers in it, but it does look quite comic booky. They almost compensate for that lack of superhero and that lack of fantasy with the way it looks. So every time a character is introduced, you get a little screen freeze frame of them, like a comic book panel where it says their name and what they do in the team. Um, you also get stuff like in action scenes, you, you get a lot of we're laughing, like we said earlier, with the walking away from explosions to slow mu music. But that's obviously, I think, what they're trying to do is show you what you might see on the comic book. So on the, in the panels, like you might see them walking away from explosion, whereas they're showing it you as a moving image, I guess. I also liked, there's a couple of like fight scenes. There's a fight scene at the end between Idris Elba and Jeffrey Dean Morgan, where a lot of the punches are like, a, it's like a point of view. And you get that a lot in comic books. You get a fist flying towards you as the reader. And I like that. It was very like um, visceral and like really, it was, I liked the way they took the visual um, of the comic book and like notched it right up to 11 for, um, for the actual action scenes of the film. Um, but yeah, was there anything else you kind of liked about it? Just follow, following on from what you said, and um, with regards to the freeze frame, they also used that, like you said, during the action, uh, during the beginning when they're about to descend on, you know, what they perceive to be the drug lords, like den, and it turns out it's, you know, they're trafficking children or using children as mules. Um, and so they start shooting, obviously, the guys that are all around there, and it, it, you see the bullet kind of enter and you see sort of the point of contact and then it would freeze. So you don't see that person, you don't see the death, you don't see any more of the gore. And it would be doing that through the lens of, you know, the sniper or sometimes you're seeing through the lens of binoculars. There were, like you said, lots of points of point of view shots, getting through different gadgets, which was great. It just adds another layer to the viewing experience. Uh, there were other point of view shots, like you said, during the violence. And then there was one where uh, Chris Evans' character, Jensen, it was really, it really stood out to me because it was just one shot. So they'd obviously done this tape using a sort of body cam, I suppose. And you can see Jensen's top, top half and he's running on these uh, their shipping tankers or something, aren't they? Where, you know, where they're sort of trying to get, get the money, kill the bad guy. And he's running along the top and you get this really great close shot of him. And it is just one shot in and amongst this whole montage of this sort of heist that's going down. But it just really stood out to me because it was the, the only shot. And I think nice little touches like that, you kind of see the, the various levels of it. That it's like they want you to see it from these different angles. Uh, so it really, in a way, like using that comic book sort of theme or trying to portray the idea of a comic book over the screen that does add kind of more layers to it, I think, rather than take away. Yeah, it's, it's a very stylish film it's a very cool film it's um there's a bit where just after they've been betrayed by the bad guy um they're all living in in the town nearest to where presumably nearest to where they were kind of last on their mission and even though they're supposedly living in this kind of it, kind of slum like town where it looks like they're kind of trying to scrape a living you know to get back to america to try and clear their names They've all, they've all still got like designer clothes. Like Jeffrey D. Morgan's still got like the sleekest suit you've seen on, despite the fact that he's living in this kind of arse end of nowhere South American town where there doesn't seem to be anything. So it's a very stylish film, but that's not not that that's a problem for me. But it's one it's one of these. It's like an Ocean's Eleven. It's it's almost it's almost important that the ensemble cast all have their own distinct look and all look quite cool. Whether you or not you care about that in your films, you can't really deny the fact that it's a very stylish film. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And um, you really get the feeling at times, you know, that they were super keen to keep the rating low as well. So the violence <laughs> is mostly inconsequential, isn't it? Like it yeah. just... Um, uh, so Aisha and Clay have quite a quite a brawl really like when they sort of first meet and you know he takes her back to his room and that and they really do punch the lights out of each other yeah you know just get up walk away pristine clean clothes not a single <laughs> hair out of place yeah. not a lot of that goes on you do get some blood and gore i think there's one where is it clay who punches his thumb into idris elba's arm yeah 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 a bit of that gore there's a bit of blood there 
uh, you get Wade driving on the Ducati into an aeroplane engine. Yeah. That was pretty cool. And I really like Wade as a character. Is it Wade? Yeah. The, the, the kind of secondary bad guy. Yeah. His, the, yeah. So the yeah. guy's who's just, he just reminded me of just any other like disgruntled employee. Yeah. Like he's around trying to sort out all these things. Like Max is like, get me an 18 man strong unit and all this. So he goes and he gets him and he does it. And then Max is like, oh, kill him, fire him, whatever. I don't care. Because, you know, he sort of towards the end of the film, Max does begin to unravel a little bit. And I think he, you sort of follow him on his kind of fall into insanity. And so he's obviously told Wade to get these guys so they can do the plan. And then he's like, nah, do whatever. And then Wade is just human. And it's just like, just reminds you of any employee and they're annoying. <laughs> It's like, oh, this guy, what does he make me do? Yeah, it's, like, it's like he's been asked to get the stuff out the back. Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh, for God's sake. It's under yeah. all the other stuff. I do like the sort of villain that Max is. Like, he's very much just the villain. There is no other side to him. He's pure evil. He looks evil. He's disrespectful to people. He talks down to people. And then he's wearing one glove and he's got like a proper, <laughs> like, just a mangled hand. And he's just, you know, just this wonderful picture. I think you said it in an earlier podcast about these, you know, moustache twirling villains. And it's yeah. like, these are the villains. There's, you know, there's no missing it. And I do feel that way about him. Like, there was no substance to him, was there? You don't. To, to be fair, I, I feel like there wasn't that much substance really to most of the characters. No, like, no. The, a lot of the relationships were sort of very fast moving and very surface level. Um, but I don't know. I think that maybe that is just territory with the film, though, as well, because ultimately, but like in my eyes, it is an action film that, you know, there were yeah. scenes, scenes where no one would speak for ages or you would get like a couple of words that's just, you know, someone going, wait, or whatever. But mostly it, it is an action film. But with, with a hint of comedy, which is, which is fun. Yeah, it's not it's not trying to do anything new. It's not trying to pull up any trees. It's very much like this is just big dumb fun, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And and having that sort of villain, like you say, almost lacking substance. They're just there to be evil, to just do evil stuff, to just be the antagonist. And I do think he's probably one of the highlights of the film for me, because he's just they say he's just so scenery chewingly, mustache twirlingly the bad guy. Yeah. Um, and I again, I've not seen Jason Patrick in that much, but he's quite. He seems quite good in this. Like he, he, he's obviously a bit like with Mask of Zorro, a bit like with other films. You can tell actors take these these roles as these bad guys because it looks like lots of fun. Yeah. To just be this maniacal, terrible bad guy who just has no rules and is just there to stir things up and just has this evil plan and is just there to just be hated and it's quite clearly something that he was having a lot of fun with oh yeah certainly something you could clear up for me actually here's a sort of a plot point that i suppose i wasn't quite clear on so is max cia well that's one of the points i had for things that we kind of didn't like so so to answer your question i think that max is their mission handler when they are on their first mission the one where they're supposedly killed and i think yeah i think he's supposedly working for the cia but kind of goes rogue and is trying to get these bombs that seem to be dematter so they kind of make stuff disappear on itself but so they're I, environmentally friendly. But they're environmentally <laughs> friendly. I love a made up. I love. I mean, I don't. I'm no weapons expert. I'm assuming there is not a bomb that makes biological matter disappear in on itself. So there's a bit in it where he blows up an island, and the island kind of disappears in a in a tornado, and then falls into the sea. I'm assuming they're not real, but I do love made up weapons in films that are always like could wipe out whole continents at one time, supposedly. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I, I do just love the detail about it being eco-friendly, you know, it's really <laughs> kind of appeal to the modern yeah. audience. <laughs> but to answer... that way, you stupid hippie. <laughs> <laughs> But to answer your question, I think he is their mission handler who's gone rogue, which is why he betrays them. I'm not entirely sure. And that's one of my problems with the film, which shows how I've probably aged a little bit, which is it's not always clear what's going on. So it isn't that clear who Max is. And around halfway through, kind of after they've got to 
They've got back from Bolivia where they are and where it's not clear who Zoe Saldana is. There's a period of about 10 minutes, I'd say about halfway through, where I'd forgotten what was going on. I knew who they were, knew who the bad guy was, but I'd forgotten like what their plan was. It wasn't clear what their plan was. And I think it's a very short film. It's like almost bang on an hour and a half. And it's almost, it's, it's a rare example of a film we do, which could probably have done with another half an hour, really. Oh, yeah, interesting. So I will say something. I watched this one twice, and I haven't done that yet uh, for this podcast. So that's interesting. But I did, so I came away from it thinking, oh, no, I need to watch that again. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, so there are these guys, and they're like, oh, what, what were they doing? And then what were those villains doing? And then, but it's, it feels, you you feel a bit daft for that because yeah. it's not a complex film. Um, no. It shouldn't be hard to follow. And I don't really think it is, but they, I wonder if, so, there were elements of the script that I thought were quite weak. I feel like more work could have been done there uh, just to make things, you know, sort of more cohesive, coherent, and to, you know, uh, it was a lot, again, like you do see with many of these action films, I suppose, it was very much exposition. And it's like, oh, no, but we left this place and we were doing this. And it's like, well, now we have to do this. And then that's it. And it's like, oh, yeah, my mum died when I was little. But now we're back to doing this. And <laughs> you know, we get that time to engage with the characters, I suppose, and engage with their life. Yeah, I feel like if this was made now, well, not now because coronavirus, but if, if it was made recently, more recently, I feel like it would have been like probably two hours maybe a bit longer, with like an extra action set piece in there and probably a bit more exposition. So I do think it's missing that. I mean, the fact that, like you say, it's not a complex film, but you still have felt that you had to watch it again to clear some stuff up shows that perhaps the, the clarity and the coherence of what's going on is lacking a little bit because it's a little bit, I suppose, the flip side of it being very stylish is it might be a little bit style over substance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, was there anything apart from the script and, and what we already said? Is there anything you kind of had a problem with, anything you didn't like? I don't think so, really. I think, you know, with these films, you do just, you take them for what they are. You know, it is, it's just action. It's a bit of fun. Like, obviously, it's very, you know, boy heavy. Like, it's all uh, guns and that. Uh, sorry, stereotypically, you know, what boys are into. So guns, yeah. knives women you know it starts off with the gang of lads and like oh we're brothers and it's you know they're playing with cards and stuff and you don't really get like there's only one female character really in it right which is Aisha yeah so you've got to think that like that is that's the audience that they're catering for it's like you know maybe these young lads that are into the comic books or you know who just like comic book films in general and it was like filling a gap you know I feel like people always want the next comic book film. So, you know, this was probably just something like coming out in between other sort of massive films. Uh, I assume so. I just assume that because comic book films are coming out all the time. Yeah. But yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we love that. <laughs> Us boys. Hey, some of them are great. Some of them are really fantastic. Others I'm not too keen on. Yeah, but it is very testosterone heavy. And it is very, it's quite cheesy. Like you say, it's quite, you know men doing men's stuff and we're brothers in arms and all that and there is only one female character which is Aisha like you say played by Zoe Saldana and she is good and she does kick ass like she holds her own with them and probably is better than them in a lot of ways but on the flip side of that she's also in her underwear about four times yes yeah, so like, and in in um and often in scenes when no one else is in their underwear either. yeah so it, it's very yeah it's quite almost like 90s throwback in a way. But and then, is that a bad thing? Did you feel you couldn't relate to it? The thing is, with Josh, I'll tell you something. What I'm trying to do, I'm trying to not sort of judge films as harshly as a, sometimes I feel like I want to. Either. Yeah. So a lot of the times, you know, when I see extended, you know, extended scenes of women who are naked and it's not, if it's not bringing anything to the story, if it's not appropriate narratively or it's not, you know, it's not creating some more engagement, because I'm not anti-nude at all. Like, you know, be nude if, it, if it's sort of integral to the story. Absolutely. But let's have some more, you know, equality. Maybe more men get nude as well. Like a dong every now and then? Well, of course. Why not? But Jason Segal in Forget Sarah Marshall. Oh, <laughs> such, respect. such respect for that. Um, 
So I try and, you know, I don't want to be just a moaning myrtle and just be like, oh, yeah, no, sex is sex is sex. Um, but in this one, I think because she was so outnumbered, mm. like, it would have been. And I imagine, because we know that crews as well are mostly male, you know, in Hollywood, most people who work there are male. That's just how it is. So I just, like, you know, you think about it, like, okay, right, we needed to get in your underwear and then you're going to lie in this bath and pretend you're getting shot at by all these guys and they're all going to be shouting horrible things against them. And I'm just like, oh, rough day in the office, you know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, what do you, how do you feel, I suppose, as a, as, as a, as a man? Like, so, it did, it was quite obvious to me that it, it was lacking more female presence. The only other female characters in it are like subordinate. So, for example, Max has a kind of servant or a PA of some sort. And all she does, again, back to the mustache twirlingly evil villain thing, all she does is hold an umbrella over him on a hot beach. She slips and he gets a bit of sunshine on him. So he kills her. So, again, that's very cheesy. That's very cliche. That idea of to show a bad guy is so horrible and so lacking in a conscience, he would just kill a subordinate staff member. That's a very action film cliche. I like having a character in it who's just in their underwear, underwear all the way through. Do I have a problem with it? A little bit in the sense of it's a bit leery looking at it now. I don't think it was done with any malice. I don't think it was done in a leering way. I think it was done in a, this is obviously a film for a certain type of person. What do they want to see? Maybe they do want to see that. If I had a young daughter, she's not likely to be watching this, so it's probably not going to be setting any bad examples in terms of you should be in your underwear or whatever. So I think it was, I think it's aged badly in that sense of in a representational sense, but perhaps it's a product of the genre, product of it being 10 years old, product of it also. It may be the source material has it in as well. I haven't read the source material, so I don't know. So it's not like a, it didn't ruin the film for me, but it's something that's obviously aged not that well and aged quite quickly in 10 years. One thing I would like to say, even though we just did the things we don't like, but just the there were some lighting choices in some of the sequences that were happening at night that were just really, really great and really just kind of, I suppose, really added to that comic book aesthetic. And there would be moments where the lighting was placed as such that half the screen would be red and half the screen would be blue and you'd get it and it would match up with which characters were in shot. It would sometimes match up with the mood of the scene and then you'd get other other uh, colours would start coming in. So then we have green when they were at the pharmacy. And then you'd, there was yellow at one point. I remember Jensen was all covered in yellow. He must have been running under a floodlight or something. And I was just like, so I was just like, so respect to the lighting guy, first of all. Because <laughs> like, there's a lot of work that's gone in there. And it didn't go unnoticed. But there was one moment. So I believe, is it was it Cooch who was, um, his wife was expecting a baby. Yeah. goes to his son at the end so when he's talking to one of the guys is he talking to Idris Elba or someone they're in like a boat this is when they're just sort of like hatching the scheme where they're about to go running in the shipping yard and you know finding all the cash and the, and the Ducati or oh, the snooks yeah three snooks and a Ducati <laughs> <laughs> um, the snooks super nukes I take it that's what I'm not too uh, sure I'm not maybe <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm not even I'd not even considered it I just thought that's what they call them yeah so it's quite quite funny the snooks and the Ducati and so they're just it's just before they're going to do that and um, Pooch is talking to the guys about like oh you know his wife's pregnant and all this blah blah and the entire like set design was blue and like blue color coordinated. So Idris Elba was drinking from a blue cup. They all had blue tops on. One of them had a blue hat on, like there was a blue folder on the side. So then I was just like, oh, I wonder if the baby's gonna be a boy. This is like the poor shadow. Ah, yeah. The baby was a boy. But yeah. but a lot of the scenes were like heavily blue. So I don't know if it was <laughs> coincidence or if it was intentional but i noticed it and i was like oh cool maybe oh, it's one of those things yeah. maybe it's one of those things the filmmaker puts in so that he could say it in the director's commentary on the yeah, dvd yeah, oh yeah. this scene we put a blue in the foreshadow that he was a boy but it is it's yeah. interesting you mentioned the scene with pooch uh going to because he goes to 
the birth of his baby boy. And that's another kind of cliched bit in the script. The script is very cliched, like we talked about with the female characters and that sense of testosterone-driven men who'll do anything for their, their team or whatever. So they have a, a thing where they decide they're going to go on the mission at the end. And there's this bit where they all go around that's like, I'm in. Okay, I'm in. I'm in. And his wife is literally going to have, and it's they, they talk about it being like a potential suicide mission. And he does that thing that they do in action films. It's like, oh, God damn it. I'm in as well then. And it's like, if you had a baby on the way and someone said to you, you don't have to come, but we're all going on this suicide mission. I, there's no way I'd go. Yeah, well, I can't let you go without me, can I? I'd go, all right, cheers. Like, th- <laughs> thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for volunteering because I've got someone I've got to provide for. So bye. But literally, like, five minutes before in the film, he's like, oh, no, I've got to meet my son. And they're like, oh, no, yeah, you can go. It was like they'd already decided that he could go, you know, and his conscience be clear and know that he's doing the right thing. No one persuaded him. No one was trying to get... They were all trying to get him to go. They were like, go to your son. But then they were all like, now we got three idiots. Oh, yeah. now we got four idiots. And like, oh, yeah. five. And it's like... Oh, your child. <laughs> it is. It's so cliched. Like it's it, like like right down to the to the like you say this that that thing slow motion walking villains mindlessly killing staff for no reason. But it's not pretending that it's anything else. I guess it's fun. It is fun, and I I did enjoy it. And you know what? I think I actually enjoyed it more on that second rewatch uh, on the well first rewatch. Second rewatch. I think I enjoyed it more on that second rewatch. Uh, so it's so to be said there, but. <laughs> And it's it's not one that I'd be like in a rush to watch again or probably even recommend to people. But saying that, I'm just thinking about some of Chris Evans's moments. Like some of them were quite funny, and you could see you could see where it was trying to be funny for sure. So uh, you know, a sucker for a journey song in a film or whatever. And <laughs> yeah. he's got his headphones in because he wants obviously to be left alone while he's in the elevator, and it works. And then, obviously, then the song starts playing again and he does, he convinces those guys that he's got telekinesis or something. <laughs> that's, the, that's like the standout that's scene for me in the film is where he, he's, he's in the stand back. I am incredibly powerful. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the that's height true. of like that song having its like, renaissance wasn't it like there was a period about 10 years ago where that song was just everywhere i can only just in fact when it came on i was like i'm only just ready to hear this song again after yeah, so it, was, it was so overplayed around that time so chris is like the it guy so when he's like doing all this you know computer stuff trying to find out you know where the algorithm is and stuff like the lines that he uses are just like really funny sort of hollow it things He's just like the algorithms on the mainframe. He's like, quick, we need to get the algorithm on the mainframe. He goes, downloading it now. And he's like, no, I need to get this on the hard drive. And then when they finally crack in and get the algorithm on the mainframe, they just get all the information they could possibly need, like more information, photographs, CCTV footage. It's just like, (laughs) click, click, click. It's like, you are like, it was just like info overload. But yeah, he was just so funny. I just want to ask you a little bit about uh, about the ending before we move on to the critical reception. Like, what did you think of the ending? Because I I found it a little bit unsatisfactory, in the sense that the villain Max just kind of gets away. Not doesn't get away with it, just gets away. Like it just it just gets the bus and just drives off. And I know the other villains like Idris Elba and people like that they get their comeuppance. And I know it's probably leaving it open for a sequel. Did you find any of the ending unsatisfactory, or did you just kind of think, yeah, it was a great ride, and that's that? No, I did find it unsatisfactory. You felt like the people that you wanted to really see get their comeuppance didn't. And yeah, like you say, Max just lays it on a bus, and our boy Wade. Now, so he obviously drives into an airplane engine, which you know. I thought it looked pretty cool. But I I wasn't rooting for his death. And I wasn't rooting for Idris Elba's death either. Now, literally until about half an hour ago, he and Clay were best friends. Or, you know, at least... Yeah, they were best friends. You know, yeah, they, they were, were, yeah. Together. And I think Idris Elba... So, Rock? Was it Roke? I think Roke. it's Roke, yeah. They're all known by their yeah. surnames. I think it's Roke, it's, but it's spelt like Roque. So, R-O-Q-U-E, I think. Yeah. So Roke, so because he yeah, so he and Clay were obviously really close. 
And he was right to have concerns. He was right to have concerns about Clay's relationship with Aisha and how that might cloud his judgment for, you know, future plans or whatever. So the fact that he turned on him, I was like, oh, yeah, I could totally see that coming. Like, he wants to get home. He's desperate to get home. You know, they've been absconded from their homes for however long it's been. And then Wade, not Wade, sorry, Clay kills him. Does Clay kill him? or He, he, he blows he the plane up, yeah. So, yeah, the airplane blows up and he sort of, Clay turns around and has a smile on his face. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. he's, your, he's your friend until about five seconds ago. You know, yeah. I'm happy about that. So obviously then that's unsatisfying. There was no proper ending with Clay and Aisha. It was all about, like, when this is over, we'll finish that dance or whatever the crap it was that they said. Um, so, yeah, it was just like nothing really got... Up. It's like you, don't, you still don't really know who the good guys are. Who the yeah, guys. it's it's like they're trying to set it up for a sequel, but they're not quite sure where they want it to go. So they're obviously keeping <laughs> open, <laughs> keeping open for Max and Aisha and people like that to come back and be villains again. But you, you'd probably think that really, in in a lot of films similar to this, you'd probably kill Max in a gruesome way, and then have Idris Elba maybe go off injured and come back as a scarred bad guy or something. But, I mean, if I've got a villain like Max, who is that, like, cartoonishly a villain, I want him to have a cartoonish death. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? I want him, you know, I want some mad stuff like James Bond level falling into a tank of piranhas or something happening to him, not getting on a bus and driving off. And getting mugged. And getting mugged. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, I wonder if that was it. If that's where that sort of hollow feeling came from at the end. It's just that, you built this villain up to be so dastardly and so utterly evil. It's like, we want to see him have his proper end. So we'll move on to the critical reception very shortly. Uh, before we do, Alice, I believe you're going to take us down the rabbit hole. I am indeed. Now, this is actually an interesting one. This is the part of the script. But we haven't spoken about Cougar at all, have we? This whole no. time. So for this segment of... Alice down the rabbit hole, we're going to be talking about Oscar Yanada, our star sniper, Cougar. Oscar spent his youth performing as a theatre actor near Barcelona in Spain and later moved to Madrid in search of stardom. After a few successful years across film and television, he was concerned that he would be pigeonholed as a comedy actor. To combat this, he signed up to play the lead in Camarón, when flamenco became a legend, that tells the story of the legendary Spanish singer and dancer Camarón de la Isla. Cameron, real name Jose Monje Cruz, had also moved to Madrid as a teenager in hopes of making it big, having been singing since the age of eight at pubs and bus stops to raise money for his family after his dad died. He is considered to be the most popular and influential flamenco singer of modern times, so I imagine Oscar had quite the task on his hands bringing someone who was already so loved by so many back to life on the screen. The role naturally involved a lot of singing, something Oscar wasn't sure about, but I skimmed through a few of the scenes and I think he does a great job. And that was Alice Down the Rabbit Hole. A little bit of a Spanish flavour to the rabbit hole. So week. yeah, I would. I, so I'm going to watch that film in its entirety now, I think. I don't know, obviously, if his singing voice was, you know, accurate, but I thought it sounded lovely. He doesn't really have any lines in The Losers, so it's, I don't even know what his bloody speaking voice is. <laughs> I suppose, does he not speak? No, he has like the odd line. Yeah, like he says to someone, don't touch the hat or something, doesn't he? Or He's usually behind, he's got his sniper rifle and he's yeah. that most of the time, so you know, he's too busy to <laughs> So we'll move on to talking a little bit about the critical reception. So um, it's, I think it's probably a tough one for you to call this week, Alice. What what do you think it did? How do you think it did? Okay? Not not well? Well? I feel like it probably did okay. It was entertaining. Uh, there was a quite a good soundtrack, I thought. We did mention that before, but yeah, good soundtrack, good score overall. It looked nice, had some great actors in it. Um, I wonder if a seven would be too generous, just sort of thinking back of some of the other films that we've looked at. You know what, if I was going to rate it, I would probably give it, I would give it less than a seven, you know, it was mm. just, I was about to say, would I give it a seven? But I feel like a seven is quite a bold statement and that's when you're getting into actually really quite good films. So I would probably go, I'll go 6.8 is what I would give it and 
probably something similar, I imagine, is what it's got. So um, on IMDb, it gets 6.3 out of 10. Ooh. On Rotten Tomatoes, however, it gets 54% from the audience and 48% from the critics. So it's quite a low critical reception in terms of what the professional critics um, thought of it. So what do you think? If we're going off the critical reception, the 48%, is that is that unfair? Is that a little bit unfair? I do feel like it's a little bit unfair because of the amount of effort that went into the style of it and the look of it. And mm. obviously, you know, where the script is lacking, where the storyline might be lacking, there are other really good things about the film. Um, so I feel like that's a, a bit harsh, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be outraged that somebody gave it that, I suppose. Well, how do you feel? So I, I think that is, I think 4, 48% is a little harsh. Um, looking at what some of the critics have said on Rotten Tomatoes, I think none of them can really say what they didn't like. It's all stuff like it's dumb, it's big, it's just stupid, it's big and it's loads of explosions. But that's clearly what it's trying to be. So I think if you're looking at a film like this, you need to contextualise what it is you're looking at. It's not, it's not Schindler's List. So, for example, one of the critics here says, the movie's based on a comic book, it fe features... A couple of actors who deserve better, such as Jeffrey Dean Morgan and Idris Elba, and some who deserve worse, like Chris Evans. I just, that, there's no need to have a dig like that. Like, I mean, obviously that shows how far Chris Evans' career has come, but why have a dig at him? Like, why, why say he deserves worse than this film? I don't really understand that because that's well, you know, obviously a bad actor. Do you know what I, mean? like, I find that really strange to have a personal dig at an actor like that. I think obviously that person just doesn't, you know, see the value in Chris Evans as a performer, uh, but we do, and that's okay. Yeah, so I would I would probably say it is underrated. It's it's big, dumb fun. It's not. It's it's definitely underseen because not a lot of people have seen it. So by that sense, it is underseen. But I think it's not trying to be anything. I think it's a big daft action film. And I think it has probably aged quite poorly. However, the, the fact that it's aged poorly isn't really its fault. It, you can't control how you age, I suppose. So judging by the 48% that the critics gave it, I'm going to say underrated. But my tastes have definitely changed. Would you agree? I would definitely say underrated. I think there is value to it as a film and, and there are like elements of it that are good, that are technically good. Uh, and like you said as well, it is, it just is what it is. It is meant to be just an action flick. It's meant to be like, oh, look at these explosions, look at these guns, look at these trucks and all that. And that's fine. You know, there's, there's no, there is a place for films like that, I think, out there. So there we go, Alice, another one for underrated. Yes. Uh underrated, I think. I feel like some of those scores were definitely a bit mean. So there we go. Uh, another one in the bag. Um, Alice, it's your turn to pick. So what are we watching next week? We are going to be watching and dissecting 40 Days and 40 Nights, the one with Josh Hartnett. Josh okay, Hartnett. Another one, but... <laughs> <laughs> so I get to Josh Hartnett, but he can't have sex or something. Exactly that. Exactly right. that. Very much looking forward to that. So, um, yeah, tune in next week when we will be watching and dissecting Josh Hartnett Can't Have Sex for a Period of Time. Um, get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. It's uh, filmsandthatpod at gmail.com. Let us know what you thought of The Losers. Um, if you've got an idea for a film that we should cover, then we'd, like, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we're on Twitter at films underscore that. We're on Facebook and Instagram, films and that pod. Uh, yeah, get in touch. We would love to, to hear from you. Uh, Alice, thanks very much for joining me. Thank you so much, Josh. And it's goodbye from me. Cheerio. Bye.